Hello investors and welcome to my YouTube channel where I study the best investors and businesses from around the world. In this week's video we'll go over the story of Todd Combs, Ted Weschler, and Tracy Britt Cool, or as Buffett likes to call them, the three T's who are known for working with Warren Buffett, one of the OGs and biggest investors in the world. Before we start, a special shout out to Robert R who suggested I cover this video. Part 1. Story of Ted Weschler and how he auctioneered a private lunch with Warren Buffett. Ted Weschler is a former hedge fund manager and Berkshire Hathaway investment manager. He is frequently mentioned, along with Todd Combs, as a potential future Berkshire Hathaway investment director. His current net worth is estimated to be at least $2.2 billion. Now, you might be wondering, how did Weschler, the youngest of five children from a middle-class family in Erie, Pennsylvania, become so wealthy? For that, we'll have to look into his life and career path. Ted was born in 1961 in Buffalo, New York. He grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. His father was an A&P executive. Consequently, he traveled extensively around the Rust Belt cities. He received his bachelor's degree in economics with emphasis in finance and accounting from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business in 1989. Let's start from the beginning of his career and his 401k returns. Weschler began his work as a junior employee at W.R. Grace, a New York City-based company, after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in 1983. He started maximizing his contribution to the Grace 401k plan a year after joining, when he was initially eligible to contribute. His account had grown to $70,384 by the time that he left in late 1989. Of this, 34353 came with him, 12328 came from Grace's matching funds, and the rest came from investment profits. That $70,384 has risen to $221.6 million by the end of 2018. By the end of 2018, the Grace money had grown to more than $58 million, accounting for nearly 26% of the $221.6 million component of his IRA that can be traced back to his time at Grace. The remaining $42.8 million in his Roth account came from funds that he established after he left Grace. He left Grace in 1989 and spent the following 10 years as a partner at Quad C Management, a Charlottesville, Virginia-based private equity business. In 1990, Weschler relocated from New York to Charlottesville to co-fund a leveraged buyout firm with Grace Vice Chairman Terry Daniels, who was also quitting the business. Because Daniels attended the University of Virginia and had a property there, Weschler and Daniels picked Charlottesville as their destination. According to Weschler, they left New York to avoid groupthink and to be able to afford attractive residences for their families while traveling four or five days a week. Weschler left Daniels after around 10 years to form his own hedge fund, which was a huge success. It provided more than 22% after fee compounded annual returns for investors during its lifespan, which lasted from January 14, 2000 to December 9, 2011. Despite having to pay $29 million in federal income tax, Weschler changed a nine-digit IRA into, into a Roth in 2012. Money that's deposited into a Roth IRA isn't tax-deductible, but money taken out is. The income limitations on IRA to Roth conversion were relaxed in 2010, making such transactions open to high-income individuals like Weschler. Weschler's conversion from a traditional IRA to a Roth cost him a lot of money in his 2012 taxes, but when he withdraws money from his Roth, he won't have to pay anything to the IRS. This implies that he'll save a lot more money on taxes than he did years ago. 
His IRA had outperformed Berkshire's stock by about 120 to 1 in 1989 to 2012, and by almost 90 to 1 from 1989 to 2018. This is, of course, outstanding results and was brought to light when ProPublica has obtained a massive trove of Internal Revenue Service data spanning more than 15 years on the tax returns of thousands of the country's wealthiest individuals. The information gives an unprecedented look into the financial lives of American billionaires, including Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Rupert Murdoch, and Mark Zuckerberg. It includes not only their earnings and taxes, but also their investments, stock trades, gambling winnings, and audit findings. But Wechsler quickly made it clear that, unlike Peter Thiel, despite his initial IRA stake growing more than 300,000% from 1989 to 2018, he hadn't engaged in any insider trading by having his IRA pay super low prices for securities that regular people couldn't buy. Wesser claimed that he achieved his results by investing only in publicly traded securities. Wesler wanted to inspire young people to do what he did to build his nine-digit net worth. Save and invest early and often, and take advantage of any employer-provided retirement account benefits. In an ideal world, no one would be aware of this account, he stated. But now that the number is out there, I'm hoping that it will serve as a motivator for new workers to start saving and investing sooner rather than later. Wechsler encourages young people to save and invest early and often and to take advantage of any employer-provided retirement account perks, as he did to develop his nine-digit net worth. Wechsler has put up incredible numbers despite a 52% loss in his IRA in 1990, which only adds to his impressive track record. Of course, it's not a completely untarnished record. He made a trading profit in early 1990, but but his funds holding Continental Health Affiliate stock and an Intelogic Trace bonds ended the year down 67 and 55% respectively from what he paid for them. To this, he said that one of my personal investment mantras is that there's no such thing as a loss. It's just an unmonetized lesson, which explains why he kept swinging for the fences despite the massive loss. Now, here's the interesting story of Ted meeting Warren Buffett and how he got to work with him. Wechsler originally became interested in Buffett's views while studying at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, and he stated in an interview that he wanted to meet the guy. According to the Wall Street Journal, he studied Buffett's techniques, and it worked out well for him when his hedge fund held $2 billion in 2011, exceeding the S&P 500 by a large margin. Wechsler was curious when he heard about the guild auctions because of his passion for Buffett's teaching. He scheduled a meeting and a group before bidding. They were terrific. They invited me in, and I ended up spending half a day at guild, Wechsler says. That gave me the comfort that this was not only an opportunity to potentially visit with Warren, but also in many ways, more significantly, to help out a really worthwhile charity. He traveled to Omaha to see Buffett for a meal at Colo's after winning the 2010 auction anonymously with a $2,626,311 offer. He won again the following year after increasing his offer by $100 to $2,626,411. Buffett was interested in Wechsler's hedge fund achievement at the meals. According to Carol Loomis, former editor-at-large of Fortune, Peninsula investors who bought the stock in the early 2000s saw a 1,236% return by 2011. Wechsler tells the World Herald, It was quite natural and chatty. We came from similar backgrounds, and we both enjoyed business as youngsters, and have done a variety of active company investment. Buffett then made a job offer at the second dinner. 
In 2011, Buffett told Fortune, I very much wanted him to do it, but I didn't expect to get very far with the idea. Ted will no doubt make a lot of money at Berkshire, but he was already making a lot of money with his fund. You can get the idea that from the size of his guild bids, so money wasn't a reason for him to come. Weschler acquired a condo near Berkshire's offices since his family wished to stay in Charlottesville, and he routinely travels to Omaha at his own expense to see Buffett and his colleagues. Now he seeks deals for Berkshire that now he seeks deals for Berkshire that can absorb a minimum of five hundred million without requiring Berkshire to own ten percent or more of the company. Wessler stated that he got his results by exclusively investing in publicly listed stocks. So, Ted, I mean, this is an incredible job, right? But maybe somewhat daunting. You're managing money for and with Warren Buffett. What's that like? That's terrific. You know, it's a, in many ways, it doesn't change much from my prior world where I, I ran a fund and I've always been kind of a a one-man band analytically, and kind of our day job is reading. And I spend the vast majority of my day reading. I try to make about half of that reading random, things like newspapers and trade periodicals. But to be able to do that in an environment uh, like Berkshire and be able to uh, you know, learn by osmosis, by uh, being able to uh, compare notes with Warren. Uh, we get together for uh, lunch every uh, Monday, the, the three of us, and Tracy, if she's in town, she'll join us. And uh, to compare notes on all sorts of things, uh, and it's mainly uh, you know Berkshire, Berkshire culture and uh, uh, things that have happened over the Warren's investing life. It's, it's very special. He, you know, I, I first was uh, introduced to uh, uh, Warren, not physically, but uh, through a friend of mine in 1979 who said, "There's this guy who." out in Omaha that when he writes, you really should read what he writes because it's, it's got a certain clarity to it. And uh, I started reading it and it was, uh, I've read uh, over the years just about everything I think Warren put out there. And uh, to have that as a backdrop and then come into the organization and be able to interact on a regular basis, it's terrific. It's, you know, learning to learn and being lifelong learners. And, and you know, that's something that impacted me because I started to read about that when I was in college. and. You know, I looked at the last five years for me at Berkshire, and they have been the steepest learning curve of my life. And that, that's pretty powerful to say when you're 50. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun, but it is that data set that you get exposed to of all these different businesses, all this information. And uh, as Todd said, taking that friction out of the equation. I'm not, I loved my investors when I ran a fund, but it takes time to talk to your investors. It takes time to write the quarterly letters, that sort of thing. That's, that's gone. Part two. How a story of Todd Combs teaches us that reading is very important key to success. Todd Anthony Combs, a former hedge fund manager and current Berkshire Hathaway investment manager, has been the president and chief executive officer, CEO of Geico since January 2020. Todd Anthony Combs attended Riverview High School in Sarasota, Florida, where he was born and raised. He earned degrees in finance and global business operations from Florida State University. Combs went on to Columbia Business School in New York City, where he earned his MBA in 2002. After college, Combs worked for the State of Florida's Banking, Securities, and Finance Division as a financial analyst. He worked as a price analyst for Progressive Insurance from 1996 to 2000, and as an insurance analyst at Keith Barrett and Woods from 2000 to 2002. Combs worked for Copper Art Capital, a hedge fund founded by Scott M. Ciparelli from 2003 to 2005. Combs funded Castle Point Capital in 2005, $35 million in startup money from Stone Point Capital. According to an investor, he worked as chief executive officer and director of the Greenwich CT-based hedge fund until 2010, during which time the returns totaled 34%. The Wall Street Journal reported in October 2010 that Buffett has chosen Combs to succeed him as Berkshire Hathaway's chief investment officer. In September 2016, 
Combs was appointed to the board of directors of J.P. Morgan Chase, bringing Berkshire's financial services connections to the top three banks in the United States. Combs was named the next CEO of Berkshire Holding Geico on December 23, 2019. He will continue to work for Berkshire Hathaway as a portfolio manager. Here's a story about how he met Buffett. In a Columbia University investment class, he was one of 165 students. I still remember it like it was yesterday, recalls Combs, who didn't meet Buffett that day. One of the students inquired about what he might do right now to prepare for a future in investment. Buffett paused for a moment before reaching for a stack of reports, trade papers, and other documents that he had brought with him. Read 500 pages like this every day, said Buffett. That's how knowledge works. It builds up, like compound interest. All of you can do it, but I guarantee not many of you will. Surprisingly, Combs began keeping track of how many pages he read and what he read each day. Finding and reading useful stuff eventually became second nature, a habit. He reads much more as his investment career progressed, averaging 600, 750, and even 1,000 pages each day. I get in around 7 or 8, and I read until about 7 or 8 at night, and uh, I go home and uh, see my family, and then I'll read uh, for another hour or two uh, in bed at night. And, uh, you know, there might only be three to four phone calls the entire week, so there's very, very few interruptions. Uh, I have a great assistant who knows everything that I read, and she kind of provides everything, and there's a back and forth between us where I'll mark it up. And, uh, and give it back to her, and we have a system for filing and so forth. But it's literally just reading about 12 hours a day of everything I just uh, mentioned. Combs recognized that Buffett's approach worked, providing him with additional knowledge that aided him in his core duty, which was to find the truth about possible investments. Combs worked as a bank regulator and in Progressive Insurance Pricing Department after graduation, and five years later, he founded Castle Point Capital, a private investment company in Greenwich, Connecticut. His journey to Omaha began when he met an Australian money manager who was traveling to California to see Charlie Munger, Berkshire Hathaway's vice chairman, and a close friend of Buffett's. I'd like to meet Charlie someday, Combs recalls, thinking. Soon later, Combs was on his way to California and contacted Munger's office, estimating that meeting Munger would be very improbable. Munger surprised him by inviting him to breakfast at the California club. I was afraid, said Combs. He'd been to two of Berkshire's annual shareholder meetings in Omaha, and New Munger was known for his frank judgments of people and companies. However, we really clicked, Combs remarked. He's the kindest, gentlest man I've ever met. Munger volunteered to meet up with them again after they chatted for hours. Combs made plans to return to California right away. I honestly think Warren would want to meet you, Munger eventually informed him. Combs, of course, required no convincing, and he was welcomed to Buffett's office in the fall of 2010. He came at 10 a.m., met and spoke with folks, then proceeded to Piccolo's restaurant with Buffett for a two-hour lunch before returning to the office. All we did was chat and speak and talk, Combs recalled. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to recognize that you've met someone exceptional. It's difficult to put into words. Ted Weschler and Todd Combs who were recently promoted to Berkshire Hathaway's billion-dollar stock pickers, are becoming increasingly important to Warren Buffett's empire future. According to CNBC's Berkshire Hathaway portfolio tracker, Wessler 59 and Combs 51 are projected to take over part of the massive company's investment portfolio, which is worth more than $750 billion in common stock. Buffett eventually began discussing his plans to recruit a money manager, and Combs began to consider another person he could propose. But Buffett, on the other hand, had a different plan. Well, I believe we're kind of thinking of you, he remarked. 
To say I was surprised is an understatement, according to Combs. Buffett discussed remuneration and advised that they both consider the offer. Combs came home and discussed the position in Omaha with his wife, April, before accepting Buffett's offer. Well, it's a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I echo everything Ted said. Um, I get asked a lot how my life has changed from before to after. And absent moving to Omaha, in terms of performing the investing function day to day, very little has actually changed, uh, except the removal of some friction uh, in terms of the fact that you don't have monthly reporting and LPs, and we have the benefit of permanent capital and so forth. But I met Warren, to go back to your, the first part of your question, through Charlie. And I called Charlie up just randomly, and I had always wanted to meet him. I had been out to a few meetings, and uh, I called Charlie up, and we hit it off. We had breakfast for three or four hours, and, um, and luckily he called me a couple weeks later, and we continued discussions, and this kind of went back and forth for over the period of a couple months. Number three, story of Brit Cool, how hard work pays off. Tracy Britt Cool had a normal childhood, assisting her parents with the farm. I had my own farmer's market stall when I was approximately 10 years old, Cool explains. When she turned her farmer's market stall into a profitable venture, she immediately realized that she had a knack for business. She was the one who employed her friends, determined their pay, and set the pricing of fruits and vegetables. Cool grew up in Manhattan, Kansas on her family's farm, and she has attributed her work ethic and her character to this upbringing, saying, Every minute that I had to work on the farm, I hated it. But it actually shaped my dedication, my work ethic, and the way that I follow through on the commitments that I have made. But with that early exposure to commerce, she helped manage the wholesale and retail sides of the family farm. She loved business and took what she had learned to Harvard University, where she studied economics and ultimately earned an MBA. At Harvard, Cool and her fellow Harvard undergrad, Teresa Hesayo, founded Smart Women Securities in 2006. It wasn't the first investment organization at the university, but it was arguably the first to cater to students with no experience. Cool and Hesayo said many women who didn't have much financial knowledge were uneasy about joining groups of students who'd been investing for years. After she graduated from college, in her class of 900 at Harvard Business School, Cool was one of the only eight to come straight from undergrad. Eight of us who were crazy enough not to work before pursuing an MBA and who would be competing for jobs with people older and more experienced upon graduation. Cool spent her summers during college interning at Lehman Brothers Bank of America and 85 Broads, now Elevate Network, and turned down a number of offers from Wall Street to go to business school. I had to drown out a great deal of unsolicited advice saying that I absolutely must work before going to business school, Cool said in the Lean In post. I knew my MBA would make me a better investor and allow me to accomplish more once I entered the working world. Cool was given an assignment while attending Harvard Business School that challenged her to envision herself 10 years from now. My ambition is to work with a terrific investor who, more significantly, is a superb instructor and mentor, she said, and this turned out to be true later on. Buffett and Cool met in 2006. Buffett agreed to meet with her after she reached out to him through the Smart Women Securities Group, which she co-founded. Buffett instantly warmed up to her because she favored basic, old-fashioned stocks to cutting-edge technology, which he himself loved. She later contacted Buffett again after graduating from Harvard Business School in 2009. After graduating from Harvard Business School, Cool got a job at Berkshire Hathaway by asking Buffett to work for him for a day, a week, a month, and do anything. At the age of 25, she became Buffett's right-hand woman, conducting financial research, accompanying the CEO to meetings, and occasionally driving him around town. Despite the fact that he did not have any available opportunities for her this time, he welcomed her to Omaha. 
They got together for lunch. She presented Buffett with some of her farm's fresh food when she arrived, and Buffett was once again blown away by her simplicity. Soon after he offered her a job as his financial assistant, as part of her responsibilities, she attended Buffett to meetings, drove him about on occasion, and conducted financial research, among other things. You basically showed up on Warren Buffett's office door and said, hire me or pay me, don't pay me, uh, I'll work for you. A lot of people have said that. What was special about your message where he said, this one I would give a shot on. You went to Harvard Business School. You did a lot of women's groups and investing, but you had to have a, a, a special message. Uh, you know, I just tried to be myself, and I think uh, probably a question for Warren, but certainly I've committed to Berkshire, and Berkshire's an amazing place, and I've always really appreciated that and really enjoyed everything about the company and really all, everything about Pampered Chef, which is uh, why we're here today. Well, you've turned it around. She became the CEO of Pampered Chef five years later, uh, although... She left Berkshire. It should be noted that Buffett and Cool are still good friends. In fact, Buffett, then 83, stood for Cool's later father, Richard, by walking her down the aisle at her wedding in Omaha, attorney Scott Cool, in September 2013. She did leave Berkshire after joining in 2009, saying that, I want to build a long term platform and a long term vehicle to acquire and build businesses. There are companies that I think there's a lot of value in helping them get to the next level, but they're too small for Berkshire. After leaving Berkshire, she had started Canbrick, a long-term investment partnership founded by her and Brian Humphrey to provide founders and owners a differentiated option versus traditional private equity. Their first company purchase was 31 Gifts, which they bought in 2020. In their annual letter, they have said that Based on our research and personal experience, we believe the combination of purpose, people, and performance drives results. This three-legged stool is rarer than the four-leaf clover. Most companies only focus on one or two areas, and few deliver on all three. With a trove of experience and wisdom, I'm excited to see where she takes Canbrick. I'd been at Berkshire about five years um, working with companies and ultimately decided that I wanted to go get operating experience. Um, from the investment side of the business, that's pretty atypical. Um, most people stay on investing, but ultimately I think that there's a lot of value to be created in companies on the operating side going forward. And so I wanted to actually go and do that myself. So I went to Warren you know, about five years ago and said, I'm ready to take a more sort of hands-on operating role. I've been running Pampered Chef or advising Pampered Chef for about a year at that point and said, I think this would be a great platform. It's a strong business, but it has the opportunity to really be reinvented for today's customer. And I felt like I brought a skill set and experience and also a perspective that was fairly fresh uh, in this space of how we wanted to transform the business and what we thought was possible. Let's ask you one last thing. Warren Buffett is famously hands-off when it comes to the companies in his portfolio, but the companies that you eventually own, do you expect to be more hands-on in working with them? Yes, um, I do, because I think there's a real opportunity going forward. Like, this intersection between investing and operating, I think, is really powerful. And I want to be an entrepreneurial business builder to really partner with management teams and to bring best practices. What I've created are sort of business systems that can be applied across businesses that really help them take them to the next level. Um, and I think there's a a real value in that. And from the managements and the owners that I've talked to, there's a real interest in that as well, where they want to find someone who can help them because they want to grow their business and be really successful uh, as well. So my hope is to find companies that are excited by that and want to partner um, with me to help sort of support that. Thanks again to Robert R. who suggested I cover this video. Thank you for watching this video entirely to the end. Nothing helps me out more than y'all sticking it out to the end please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already done so. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like this video and subscribe to my channel so that I can continue to make videos like this for you to enjoy.